Welcome to the Bible Forum. It's Sunday night, December 8, 2019. Getting close to the change over here. What is the reality that most people refuse to accept? Of all the religions in the world, biblical Christianity remains unique. Biblical Christianity is a faith system, meaning you must actually believe the principles, not merely understand them, not merely know them. Belief, therefore, implies action, and it's an action that's consistent with the belief. For example, I know I'm not perfect, but with practice, greater understanding and desire, I can do better. I can be better. In most of the religions of the world, the same thing is true. In biblical Christianity, it's not really like that. The Bible declares Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the result of this is that God declares, verse 10, that there is none righteous. No, not even one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's a description of humanity in all its own glory. Unless something or someone interferes into the life of that person, that's the way they're going to grow up and live. However, in verse 19 of the same chapter, we read, Now we know what things soever the law saith, that saith to them with under law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what law does. It lays out the rules and the regulations. It measures you against it, and you don't measure up. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by the doing principle, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. For by the law is merely the knowledge of sin. The law says, I got you. Now you know you have to stop at that sign. You have to not do this. That's all it can do for you. It cannot make you better. Think about it. Every religious system that requires regulated behaviors is merely agreeing with God that we know we're sinners. Don't do that. Do this. Acting out the deeds of the law is not solving the problem. If the law says I should not do this and I do it because the law says I should not do it, how have I improved? All I'm really doing is highlighting the fact that law is important and necessary. And those who are locked into these religious legalistic systems generally have no idea what they're doing. By acting out all of these different rules and regulations, they do feel as if they are closer to God. Whatever it is that God would require. But in reality, nothing has changed. Not in their relationship with God. He's still the rule maker and we're still obeying the rules, but that's about it. And all of this because, as the Bible says, all have sinned. It only takes one sin to be a sinner in the eyes of God and then therefore to be held responsible. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which is the standard. And that sin may have been when you were two years old. You don't even remember it. All of these behaviors that these so-called churches have laid out and said, if you do this and you do that, these are all prescribed by men, not God. God doesn't have these. What does Christianity offer that's different? Well, you go back to Romans again, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law, without the doing of anything, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You can read them. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, not in, Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, you do realize countless men and women were declared righteous in the sight of God before there was a law. Think about Adam, Abel, Seth, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the people involved in those families having a righteous standing before God based simply on what they believe. A belief that motivated righteous attitudes, righteous behaviors. A religious belief that translated into a lifestyle, all of which gave them a moral standing with God. The other people we read about in Scripture, and even the ones we don't know anything about, they weren't part of these men's families, they all fell short. They did not know the truth. Meaning, they're not in heaven. No matter how good a person they may have been. Now today, if you say stuff like that, you're harsh. Well, I, that, 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 that guy over there, that woman, they've never done a thing wrong in their life. How can you say that... To, they have never repented of their sin and embraced the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. They have set out to try to do it on their own. It doesn't work. It didn't work according to God's standards. God's standards, which are immutable, meaning unchanging, and are holy above all. An unchanging, dedicated, hallowed, consecrated thing or person or behavior. Modifiers which are far above the human definitions, the human expressions of righteousness. In this Bible passage, Romans 3, verse 10, the glory of God is being weighed against the glory of men and, and is being viewed as falling short. How short? Woefully short. Think about that the next time you think God will understand your sin because of the circumstance or the situation. No, he doesn't get into an understanding mode. God demands faith in him, in the cross work of his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the safety and security of what is called in the Bible salvation. Salvation, a spiritual transaction we cannot see, touch, nor fully comprehend when it occurs. A transaction that takes place between the sinner and God only when the sinner recognizes his or her sinful condition, the way God sees it, and repents of that sin, that sinful condition, that sinful propensity, that sinful behavior, and fully trusts in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ to pay the price of that sin. It's a heartfelt transaction that manifests itself in a lifetime commitment to God in Christ. A commitment that steadfastly attacks sin wherever, whenever it pops up, whether it's in our own minds, in our own habits, in our own commitments, 
in our own mouth, in our own heart. A transitional process that continues as long as we have breath. It's called growing in Christ, becoming better at it. This is what the Bible calls salvation. And anything less is called a works righteousness system. The effort to be righteous in the sight of God based on what you do. And the works righteousness system, whatever it is, however it's designed, whoever it is that came up with it, it doesn't matter. It is worth absolutely nothing in God's economy. Why? Because you did it. It's what you did. You did not do this. You did do that. You are applying human effort to what is inherently, fundamentally, a godly task. And you are getting whatever praise, whatever glory proceeds from it. You are living this life and people are noticing that it's wonderful and it's great and it's a benefit to you and to everybody that knows you and they give you credit. And that, my friend, is all you will ever get is credit from other people. You will never get credit from God. Salvation is a spiritual transaction. A transaction that no one sees. But a transaction everyone will see as you live it out. It renders you unrecognizable to your family and to your friends. It renders you guilt-free, penalty-free, desirous only of what pleases God. It replaces your guilt, your hopelessness, with inner spiritual peace and comfort and assurance. And, and we still don't know what it is or how it really works. All we know is we're free from the guilt, the burden of sin. We have a new and better hope, a new and better peace. We have a new and better desire, goals, purpose. So what happened? Well, by various means, the Spirit of God has penetrated into your selfishness and pride with a sense of divine guilt, convincing you internally that this is wrong. The means vary from a remembrance of parental influence to an overt or sudden explosion of divine information filling our minds and hearts with new understanding. But whatever it means, we are now intellectually and spiritually arrested. We no longer think the way we thought. And when we do, it troubles us. We are no longer wondering about our spiritual relationship with God. We have a peace. We understand it. We are faced with a reality, a new reality that begs attention and it begs further action. And regardless of the means, the result is always the same. We have a compelling desire for information. We want more knowledge of God, about God. We now have more information about God that we actually believe than we ever have before. And we have this information in a way that just drives a, an implicit trust. We believe it's right. It works. It's, even if we don't understand it fully. Knowledge which points to our guilt and need. Knowledge that begs belief. Being called upon to believe this message, this calling, realizing all of this as faith and implicit accept acceptance of the message called the gospel. An acceptance which is more than just simply knowing 
an acceptance that comes with faith, trust, based on reliable knowledge. Bible words like upon and into are there to communicate intensity and direction. Other words like leaning and resting, looking unto him, committing one's life. The key is taking God at his word. The challenge comes through the gospel. The gospel says that all human beings are born sin-oriented. We only need to watch a two-year-old to understand what that means. Which says that pe sinful people cannot expect to be with God in heaven. He is not a sinful creature. He is pure. You're not. It ain't going to happen. The God of heaven, the God of the Bible, is sinless and holy. Which says that unless we are as holy as God, our destiny is somewhere else. And the only somewhere else is a place God calls hell. A place where you are separated from God throughout all of eternity. With the knowledge that you didn't have to be. Locked into our sin, which we actually blame God for, uh, in this torment. The pivot point is faith. Do you trust God? Or do you continue to trust yourself? A trust that is based on adequate knowledge, written in a very thick book, very comprehensive, a basic knowledge, in this case, of God. Trust expressed in assent to that knowledge. We call it belief. The sort of trust that is rational and reasonable. But the big question is, do you even believe there's a God? Did you know that belief in God is built into every human being at birth. We're born that way. We have a natural tendency to believe there's a God. We look at the various people groups, groups on earth. They all have a God. A God they're willing to die for. Human beings must work at stifling, smothering their innate belief in God in order to reject Him. So what God or gods do you serve? Is it the one true God of heaven? Or the one you either have created or that most satisfies your ideas about what a God ought to be? Everybody listening to the sound of my voice right now knows exactly what I'm saying is true. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Well, you have options. You can repent of your sinfulness and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel remedy. But you can also reject the message of salvation and continue the way you're going and hope for something better. Or you can set the whole thing aside until you have time or you have an inclination or you have a need to consider it. Now keep in mind that last option is really tricky, since you have no idea how much time you have left. Have you ever trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? Have you ever given Him your heart and your life in a moment of prayer, serious matter, If you haven't, I would encourage you to do so and watch what God does. You will be amazed.